Welcome to Yakety Yak, CSI's series of interviews and conversations with Australians prominent in the field of social impact. And tonight, hosted by the Macquarie Foundation, we're here in Melbourne to have an interesting conversation with Simon McKeon, known as a game-changing philanthropist, prominent this year, of course, with the Award of Australian of the Year. Good evening. Simon comes with television makeup on. <laughs> Straight from Channel 10, <laughs> live and in person. And at Channel 10, he was on the 7 p.m. project, which has got a particularly young demographic, um, and was talking about the, I think we can say without doubt, almost certain charities commission, which is about to be Ooh. announced by the budget tomorrow night. Mm. So what good would a charities commission do? Well, Peter, there has been talk over the weekend that the budget will tomorrow uh, announce the establishment of, I'm not sure what it's going to be called, but let's call it a, a charities commission, which I think uh, a number of people in the charitable sector have been calling for now for probably a couple of decades. And from, a, from the sector's perspective, I think it's looking for firstly a, an eradication of, or certainly a reduction of red tape and filling out forms three different times for three different government departments and looking for a, uh, a focused department that understands what the charitable sector is all about. And I guess from you know, the perspective of a, of a citizen, hopefully this commission will provide data and uh, give us an insight into what part of the sector is working well, what isn't working well, how it can be improved, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, look, we'll have to wait to see what the devil is uh, in the detail, but at this stage, it's, uh, I think it's a great initiative. Is there a regulatory role for such a thing? No, oh, very much so. I think that uh, uh, you know, hardly a week goes by where we're not hearing for all sorts of reform in the charitable sector. Um, uh, you know, have we got the licensing right? Have we got the reporting requirements as far as uh, how we produce annual reports? There's all sorts of things that we actually just haven't had much of a focus on in this country, whereas other countries, such as the UK, have had a, uh, you know, such a commission for quite some time. In a way, I suppose it talks about the coming of age of the third sector. Look, I think it does. The um, non-for-profit sector in a country like Australia is just uh, massive. Um, everyone knows that in this audience. Uh, it's broad. It does all the things that uh, neither the corporate sector nor the government sector are willing or able to do. It picks up all those pieces that fall, uh, all those people rather, that fall between societal's cracks and the amount of work it does is just phenomenal. Um, it's a tens of billion dollar industry if, if you want to measure it economically. And, uh, you know, with that positioning, it's important that we make it as good a, a sector as we can. I'm intrigued. How do they tell you that, how do they hint to you that maybe you'll be the Australian of the year? Uh, there are some secrets here that I'm not really... Can, can I just say one thing, and that is that, look, it is an extraordinary honour, and for someone like me who's had the privilege of uh, making a decision some time ago, you know, not to work full-time and to uh, actually join quite a number of other people that have uh, made the decision to either work part-time or, or not at all, but to give time to the charitable sector, never a day goes by, Peter, where I'm not rubbing shoulders with people that have made... Uh, you know, far greater sacrifices than, than I have. So that's the, um, the humble bit, if you like. But on the other hand, um, you know, to answer your question, you are given a very short tip off <laughs> or a short period of time like to, to prepare. If, if yeah, forward, that's right. That sort of and the reason they do is that, uh, you know, firstly, there are things called diaries which basically have to get <laughs> thrown over the shoulder. Um, it is an, um, an amazingly taxing year. For me, it's a, a wonderful year because it gives me an opportunity, after I get the guilt built out, <laughs> um, that it's just a great opportunity to talk about things that I think are, uh, are important, hopefully inspire a few people to, you know, to, to think about their life's opportunities in another way. Um, and this year will you know, go like a flash as well. But um, look, they do give you a tiny bit of preparation or, or thinking time so that um, you know, the 12 months can be used as well as it might be. What opportunity does it give you? Look, I think in my case, uh, you know, bearing in mind that five of my six predecessors have been uh, extraordinary academic giants. Uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, Patrick McGorry last year or 
Tim Flannery and Fraser, you know, they found cures for cancer or they've made huge inroads with uh, taking the environmental debate further. I come along, I'm a bit of a, when you think about it, a bit of a dunce of the class because I'm not a giant in any particular area. All I bring is, um, is passion, um, just an enthusiasm for a sector that's given me so much more than I've ever given it. It's an embarrassingly simple message I have when I think about it. But um, the opportunity is for me to share that uh, wonderful experience that I've had, often with really busy people, um, particularly senior business people that I rub shoulders with all the time. Uh, and I, I don't say that I challenge them so much. I say, look, I reckon there's an experience that um, your business in the uh, corporate sector or the government sector, whatever it is, there's an experience that I've got in mind that you won't get in your daily existence and it's a very special experience. It's getting right close to the coalface of need. It's seeing lives transformed before your very eyes. You can't get that through the television or, <laughs> or the daily newspapers or whatever. You know, come with me and, and, and let's see if it, it works for you. And you know, most times it does. I think it's fair to say, without some of the bumps along the way, you wouldn't have been the suitable candidate that you became. It's actually you no, you're, right. you're absolutely right, Peter. I've, um, I've had, you know, two or three things along the way that have almost, if you like, frog-marched me into this sector. And I look back and I may have resisted <laughs> every now and then, but uh, look, life is serendipitous. We all have our, uh, our reasons for, for getting involved in the charitable sector, every one of us. In my case, two or three of them were quite profound, but having come here, I'm really glad that I did. Let's talk about some of those things. You were brought mm. up in Dandenong. Yep. Which uh, was the place where migrants lived. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a working class suburb. It's an earthy suburb. Uh, you know, when I went to school, uh, most of my friends, their fathers Dandenong worked- Dandenong East Primary. No Absolutely, school. yeah. Uh, most of my friends, their fathers worked on long production lines with General Motors or uh, International Harvester, Heinz, uh, a lot of that big industry is now gone and been replaced by uh, light engineering and, and what have you. But it's a very industrial suburb. It's, uh, it attracts first time immigrants. Um, I think at my school there were 54 different ethnicities and I've been back to the school a few times recently. There's still that number of ethnicities, if not more, but they're different countries nowadays. It's, uh, it's constantly changing. But it was a great suburb to grow up in because um, there was never a problem in our family. My father was a you know small businessman, if you like, never pharmacist. Pharmacist, yep. So there was ne stars, right? yep, mm. never a, a problem with food on our table. But you know, literally, look over the back fence and you could see a very different existence. We lived not that far from a housing commission area, and you know, I won't say there was starvation but there was deprivation in all sorts of other ways and I remember that there was I think a building recession or something in the early 60s and um, there were a couple of twins in my class and you know one day the I sat at the back of the class I could see out a window and the headmaster and a and a sergeant police sergeant who I, who I knew actually came to the, the door and knocked on the door and walked inside and had a muffled conversation with our teacher and then these two uh, red-haired twins were summoned outside and we didn't really know what happened at the time but later on word got round that their father had um, taken his life you know I didn't pretend to understand all the detail at the age of seven or eight but I think he was a product as I learnt later on of just you know a recession couldn't make ends meet you know life was a bit raw when it came to uh, you know being a young a young boy in Dandenong. Recently you met up with Mr Vague. Yeah. Mr. Vague <laughs> was a Year Five teacher. Yeah, Year Four. Yeah, yeah a great name, isn't it, Mr. Vague? Well, yeah. <laughs> Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He 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 was great. Um, he was probably the first teacher that really, and we were in grade four, and he treated us like uh, really young adults. He had conversations with us, and uh, and treated us with enormous respect and. I don't know, I woke up a few years ago and I said, whatever happened to Mr. Vague? I had no idea whether he was still alive, but uh, with that unusual name, it wasn't that hard to track him down in the... Uh, <laughs> in fact, I got onto his cousin and uh, his cousin said, no, nah, you want the school teacher? And I got onto um, to Mr. Vague, Neil Vague, and it's been really great catching up with him. You know, he is one of these people I referred to briefly before who uh, never regarded their teaching 
as a job, it was a pure vocation. And uh, even today, into his 80s, he's still volunteering at that school, um, uh, you know, doing a bit of RE and, and what have you. School. Yeah. Um, look, he may have retired this year because <laughs> he's been a bit ill, but up until last year, most certainly, and uh, he and his wife. And, uh, you know, extraordinary inspiration to see and people like that. what does Mr. Vague remember about the uh, future Australian of the Year? Look, um, well, he knew I was the kid that lived, you know, sat up the back and looked out the window and daydreamed most <laughs> of the Look, none of my teachers, Peter, would say that um, I was much of a... I showed much promise, and, and that's okay. I mean, I, I really didn't show much promise, and I, I probably spent most of my time in school just just dreaming. Um, but anyway, I got lucky and, you know, did university and found a, um, a profession that suited me and, yeah. Your father and mother mm. were quite a bit older than other they were. parents were of the, your cohort of kids. Yep. <coughs> and uh, they were very involved in the community. Yeah, they were. I, I kind of felt <laughs> I was almost raised by grandparents. They were into their 40s, you know, when they had me. And uh, apart from an older sister, you know, it was a, a, a small and in some respects unusual household. But whilst I may not have been that close to them as, as other friends of mine who had parents who were younger, um, I certainly remember my parents as being people who, uh, who gave back to the community. They, they were involved in various hospital auxiliaries and uh, I don't know, dad was big in Rotary and, and they were just forever organising things. But what got me was that they actually had a whole lot of fun in doing it. They didn't see it as any sense of um, moral obligation or they, they didn't kind of intellectualise about it. There was just a job to be done. It was a suburb with all sorts of need. And they not only got down and did it, but they actually had a really good time doing it. And uh, uh, I've got to say, as, as a young boy, I remember saying, you know, I might not be that close to my parents in some respects, but they had a quality that I said, look, I'd really like to, to grab that and not let that go. In terms of shaping character, it would have been an interesting jump to go from Dandy Long East Primary School to Melbourne Grammar. Yes, it did. Um, but here's a case of, of a father who, um, uh, look, he was a pharmacist, but, you know, only a pharmacist in Dandenong. But I think his, uh, his big ambition was to send me to a school like that. I actually started off there in, in boarding school. And, uh, um, you know, how often do we hear that story of, of Australian parents just wanting the very best for their kids? And, oh, it was a huge contrast. I remember the very day going from Dandenong, uh, housing Commission literally next door to the junior school of uh, one of Melbourne's most prestigious schools and um, for some reason I had the idea that I was allowed to take my dog to boarding school and I, I was really annoyed that when we got there and the dog had come in the car that I wasn't allowed to keep it there for some reason but um, it was an extraordinary contrast and all of a sudden I was mixing with kids from you know the Western District whose uh, I don't know parents had been or were active ministers in a federal government and had traditions and family heritage, you know, very different from mine. So, yeah, it was quite a, quite a leap. Well, I was just thinking of the former Prime Minister coming from the Western Districts. So yeah, it wasn't him, but there was a, <laughs> yep, there was a minister there at the time. He had kids. Uh, you describe yourself as a plotter. Yeah. Um, Which, what was going on? Well, I, I did plot. In fact, uh, Melbourne Grammar, um, put me on a pedestal along with a few other people uh, a year or two back in a book that they released and, and they asked me to write a few notes and I said look I was just slow out of the blocks um, if you go and talk to my cohort in, uh, at, at, at that school I actually wasn't the captain of, of anything um, well actually I was the captain of the tuck shop I think or something <laughs> um, but I was always just playing a support role and I was very relaxed with that um, it probably actually wasn't until uh, my tertiary years where, I don't know, perhaps I was just a late maturer, but I suddenly realised, uh, not that I had any, any, had, uh, sorry, had any great ambition to, to be a leader or to put my mark on the world, but it was just that I started seeing jobs to be done. Um, I actually had a sporting career in yachting which was starting to bloom and, and uh, you know, we're doing interesting things there. And, 
And I guess, yeah, look, my, my early years were plotting years, but well, then... Well, look, there's one thing that really actually did light you up, it was yachting. Yeah. And sailing. And you could do that in Melbourne Grammar, could you? No, you couldn't. In fact, that was one of the problems with that school. They made me do other sports that I wasn't any good at, such as cricket and footy on a Saturday. But, um, look, yachting isn't the most um, prestigious sport of, of, of all time. But for me, it was just something that worked. I liked getting out with the elements. There was a bit of thinking involved in it. Hydrodynamics, aerodynamics, tactics. Um, I didn't mind being really cold or you know whatever it was, and what it just worked for did me. Did you take it up? Oh, I took it up probably as a young teenager, but mm. the difficulty was that I didn't really take it seriously until um, I just left school. And in my university years, uh, I almost went quite manic with it. In fact, there were lots of times I really weren't in lectures and I was doing campaigning overseas or whatever, and you know, went through a few quantum leaps quite quickly and all of a sudden found myself at, a, at an international uh, level, which I really, really enjoyed and, um, you know, that consumed really much of my university life. So law and commerce mm -hmm. at Melbourne University, <coughs> then um, you can't have been too much of a plot of Blake Dawson take you on. Yeah, they did. Um, I haven't seen any plotters there. No, well, <laughs> perhaps they made a mistake. But look, but that was part of the ride that was really starting to take off because I... I landed on my feet. I ended up in this uh, extraordinary little part of Blake Dawson Waldron, which during the 80s was advising, um, you know, all those racy entrepreneurs, the Alan Bonds and the John Spalvins, and uh, you know, so the list went on. And they were riding high at that time. Um, so you got involved in mergers and acquisitions. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and um, it was interesting because I, I sort of knew deep down in my bones that that some of the decisions that were made by these guys, you know, were simply not sensible. But I was a very junior lawyer in short pants, basically, and I wasn't particularly influential around the table at that time. But it was a terrific time for me to, um, to actually see how business uh, could sometimes be, um, you know, struck on a very, very fragile uh, foundation. And it was no surprise to me when you know, the 87 or the, the late 80s came along and so many of them uh, fell over. Indeed, that was a very important part of my education as a young lawyer, um, seeing how decisions shouldn't be made. Also, in terms of personal habits, you found yourself working with people that sort of prized excellence <coughs> yep. and would work around the clock on deals. Yeah, and I never found that particularly hard. Um, I guess, for me, it was just a matter of finding something that I was really interested and passionate about and then... Um, you know, you didn't notice the, the clock, so to speak. And I did aspire to, you know, a certain degree of excellence. Mm. You decided to move back to Melbourne. Mm. Um, I did that because uh, this older sister that I briefly referred to earlier... Um, Diane. Diane, yeah, she, um, she'd been born with an intellectual disability and, and, you know, my older parents had really had most of the... Um, the care responsibility for her. But things started to get a little demanding for my parents who were really starting to get on in years at that point. And uh, I think my wife and I would have been very happy to have stayed in Sydney indefinitely. It was a, like Melbourne, great place and we had lots of friends and what have you. But there was a call from Melbourne that there was a situation getting a little out of control down here and you know my parents, they didn't really ask me, they certainly didn't beg me to come back, but it was the right thing to uh, to come back to Melbourne and I took the opportunity then to um, uh, to spend a year with an investment bank because investment bankers were clearly having much more of an influence on how deals were shaped and uh, and what have you and I said no well I'll join Macquarie it was then, then Hill Samuel, Hill Samuel mm. just for a year and uh, then go back to the law and continue on and I'm still doing that year 20, <laughs> 26 years later. How could you help Diane? It had become a difficult situation because uh, Di had uh, probably had an intellectual age of around 12 uh, and um, she was a good 12 or 13 years older than me and had married uh, uh, a husband with a similar intellectual age. Um, uh, Di surprised my parents. There was some thinking that she could never have children but she produced two. And, uh, there was a real issue with the husband's um, schizophrenia, which was, um, which was very difficult, really challenging. It, it resulted in uh, physical abuse, particularly of the children, and 
just as those three or four years went by that we were up in Sydney, it was clearly, uh, you know, not getting any better. And the decision was made, we really need to come back and, and help uh, in whatever way we could. One of those two children has lived a happy, normal life. Look, one of the most wonderful things about whether it's the non-for-profit sector or just looking at, you know, families and, and what have you, is that there, there is always hope. There is always hope. And in the case of my sister, uh, you know, her issue really was just deprivation of oxygen during the birthing process. So, you know, fundamentally, she's perfect. But, you know, a few brain cells just didn't make it through that, um, uh, that process. But she has produced one child, Jill, who has been um, an example to all of us. She's a remarkable young lady, has her own wonderful family of three and, uh, um, and, and is a beautiful carer today for her mum. And her son, Tony? It's a different story. It's a different story, yeah. He, um, uh, he had troubles along the way and uh, certainly uh, it became very plain to, uh, to my wife and, um, and indeed our, the boys that we had, that we had to open our home up to, to Tony. Um, he had, you know, various demons, but then on the other, on the other side, he had a warmth and um, an affection that was, you know, really genuine as well. He was a tortured soul because there were times when he would just uh, make you laugh and, and inspire you, and then other things would happen, uh, and his lack of intuition or just being able to predict what was right or wrong would get in the way. And so his life, I guess, uh, you know, you'd have to describe as a troubled one. He uh, was driven to taking the life of his son. Yeah, um, and this is public, so um, in the sense that it was a criminal matter and it was reported uh, when it got to the courts, etc. Um, but it was very tough because he linked up with a partner of probably similar intellectual age, and and they had a child, and uh, obviously you'd expect the families of of both sides did what we could to set them up in a uh, in accommodation that was appropriate and. And the mother of, um, of his partner uh, just lived around the corner and, and they did a great job. But notwithstanding that, the fact was that Tony became the principal carer at night times because um, you know, his partner just really couldn't cope staying up for prolonged periods of time. And as it turns out, the one perfect thing that he created, this, uh, this lovely young baby, while he was trying to care for it at nights and it would have colic and all the other things that babies have, uh, one night when he was trying to care for it, he just lost it and um, he just squeezed it too hard and, and snuffed the, the life out of, out of this little baby and, you know, all of a sudden it was, you know, we'd been doing what we could with this situation, you know, behind the scenes and all of a sudden there were television cameras outside his unit and um, homicide squad and, and, you know, you go from being behind the scenes to uh, front page news and here I am. I can't recall, I think uh, I was either running the Melbourne office or 2IC and, and you know, I'm walking down the outside the county court um, with bail applications and all sorts of things. And yeah, it was, it was real, um, it was in your face, but it was yet something that we had to deal with. But Tony didn't go to jail? No, I obviously knew Tony's story. And, uh, and when I talked before about the warm side of Tony, I'm, you know, trying to be 100% authentic. And what I had to do, starting with the Homicide Squad, which interrogated him for, for 12 hours on the, the day that it happened, um, uh, I had to get that story across to, to them. I had to get that story across at 2 a.m. that night to a bail justice that we got out of bed. You know, at the end of a very long day, the Homicide Squad said, look, uh, we'll lock him up, but um, you know, we've heard your story, Mr. McKeon, and we'll see you in court. Uh, on Monday morning, it was actually on a Saturday that it happened, and um, you know, you will apply for bail through your, your counsel. I said, you know, I just don't want Tony, if I can all, at all do anything, to spend one night in jail because uh, I, I understand the importance of getting strong messages out to the community, and we have jails for an obvious reason, but he's an individual that I don't think will, will be at all um, you know, positively looked after in jail. And, He's been vulnerable all his life and, 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 and I was told by the, the chief of the homicide squad, 
You do realise that if you go to an out of sessions bail justice tonight, you deprive yourself of the right to seek legal counsel and uh, ask again on Monday morning if you fail tonight. So I weighed that up and I said, no, um, I think I've got to fight tonight because I just don't want him, if I can, to spend one night in jail. He's committed the most abhorrent crime imaginable. I'm not shying away from that, but he has his own story and uh, remorse certainly wasn't an issue. So we went before this fellow in his pyjamas and uh, <laughs> you know, told the story. And it was a long story because uh, you know, there were years of, of background to tell. And, uh, and then the bail justice looked to the homicide, the inspector, and, and he said, right, well, you've heard what Mr McKeon says. He wants to keep Tony out of jail. What do you think? I presume you'd like to uh, lock him up and uh, sort it out on Monday morning. And the homicide fellow said, um, no, we've spent all day on this matter. We know the, uh, the, real, the real story here. We, we don't need to say anything. And the bail justice um, said, OK, well, on, under certain conditions, Tony can go home with you. And flashing forward then, you know, a year or so down to the trial, and uh, we, uh, we plea bargained. We obviously uh, accepted a charge of manslaughter, but he never went for uh, murder one. Um, and brilliantly, the uh, Supreme Court uh, His Honour Justice Teague, uh, in a very first for a Victorian criminal history, arranged on the day of sentencing for the parole board to be uh, commissioned that afternoon, such that uh, Tony never actually spent one night in jail. He was out on immediate parole. Why do I tell this very long story? You know, anyone who says that the issue of, you know, mental health or those that are doing it tough, you know, we can just fix them up with a government department well funded and good professionals, it just doesn't work that way. When you're dealing with people that, you know, how do I put it, have a mixed up mind, you know, a mind that um, struggles just coming to intuitively sound decisions, you're in a very different place that our institutions can easily cope with and, uh, and not for one moment do I nor Tony could ever condone the awful thing that he did. On the other hand, there has to be, you know, compassion has to play a role somewhere to get the right, the right decisions here. And all I can say is that um, in that awful, awful saga, the system got it right. The homicide squad, the, just, the, the, um, the judge, uh, the prosecution, the parole board, they actually got it right. Took an awful lot of work on the part of me and a whole bunch of other people, but of course, for every one of those cases, there must be a dozen others where, those, where the Tonys of this world don't have that help and they end up in our jails. What learnings do you take from that? The system got it right. When you think about the third sector, for example. Very good question. Um, the system is not as bad as we would make it out to be. Um, the system is just full of people like all of us in this room trying to do their job as well as they can. But we ask an awful lot of the system. I think where the non-for-profit sector comes in is to say, well, what can we do to assist the system to make it work better? In, in the case of Tony, it wasn't just me. I was reaching out to um, every organisation that had anything to do with Tony in his life. And they were not only helping him, but coming forward and telling his story to, to the system. It was a big job over a year or so to present all of that to ultimately the, uh, the judge in the Supreme Court. What worries me though is that, as I said a moment ago, you know, typically people who are at the bottom of society's pile, they, they may not be lucky to have a supportive family or, or even to know how to ring up uh, the salvos or whatever and, and get that support. At 39 years of age, you decide to step down from full-time work. Yep. Not that you didn't take on plenty of other jobs. Yep. But that's a pretty radical thing to do. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't. Um, investment banking is uh, an unusual profession in one way in that you can actually peak quite early. Um, you know, I was involved in... Like Mozart. <laughs> not like Mozart. <laughs> but, you know, you, you do end up doing sometimes things really way beyond uh, your, your years in one sense. You're given responsibility at a, at a young age. And at a place like Macquarie, I mean, I was surrounded by frankly, much better investment bankers anyway. So it wasn't as if I felt that I was in any way, um, you know, unique or, you know, the only person in the shop doing it. But frankly, the calling was much stronger than that because um, 
you know, it went back to my parents. I just felt that, um, and, and in, incidentally, if I can just butt, my, uh, butt in. Uh, uh, to interrupt I'm yourself. Interrupt myself, rather. You know, I'm not the first Macquarie person that's, um, that's done this. In fact, I think this investment bank has an extraordinary tradition of uh, not only supporting wonderfully a, a great foundation uh, led, by, led by Julie, but uh, I can think of literally a dozen people that have uh, made an enormous, they could have stayed at, in, at, at Macquarie and done all sorts of things, but they either decided to leave the place full time and uh, set up extraordinary organisations like uh, Michael Trail with Social Ventures, or alternatively have done what I've done and had a, a foot in both camps which enables one to bring the corporate world along at the same time in, in one's endeavours. So, look, you know, people have said to me, gosh, you know, you were good to do what you did. Uh, honestly, I don't think I was. It was just a logical thing to do. Um, and, and I just never wanted to leave it too late to spend some serious time in the, um, in the community sector, or certainly when I was a spent force and not able to perhaps do things that I have been able to do in the last 10 years or so. Come 45, and you suddenly Ooh. get struck by symptoms which turn out to be MS. <laughs> yeah, um, th that was a weird time. I was actually, uh, the, the very first episode, as they call it, was um, I was around the Boral board table, and uh, it's all public now. Um, we were talking about splitting the company in two, having Boral building, um, the, b the building company go on, and and create uh, what was Origin Energy. And uh, we had this long board meeting, it went for about two or three hours, and I just remembered my legs becoming a bit numb, pins and needles, but that happens every now and then. Uh, anyway, I stood up at the end of the meeting and I literally collapsed. Um, I pushed the chair back, stood up, and my legs just went to jelly. And I remember it vividly because there was this uh, tablecloth around the board table, and everyone had their board papers on it. And as I went down, I pulled this tablecloth with me and Half the board papers of the directors went <coughs> on the floor. And people around, and this was a blue blood board, just looked at me as if I was um, drunk. You know, it was a kind of quite embarrassing moment. I had no idea what had happened. I knew it wasn't just pins and needles. With the help of a colleague, struggled onto a plane, got back here. Um, big, big, big series of tests. But they don't know what it is. Um, the, one of the reasons the word multiple is in multiple sclerosis is that you've actually got to be diagnosed with a, a number of other episodes and um, I actually went basically blind um, a year or two later and it was at that point that the neurologist said yeah we think we know what what you've got. It was a spooky time. Um, uh, I, I was tasting you know the seductive joys of of all sorts of good things in the business world and then in the non-for-profit sector the yachting career was going well and father of four, you know, life was very, very good. And all of a sudden I didn't know whether, um, particularly when I was paralysed from the hip down, whether I'd kicked the last footy with the kids or whether life was going to change dramatically. It was um, a really interesting time. How did that influence you? I'd already made the decision that the non-for-profit sector was important for me. So it was not my Damascan Road experience that had, you know, happened previously. But I have to say, it took me up another gear or two. I can remember being in hospital a couple of times saying, look, if I can get out in one piece, um, I, I really never want to take any day for granted. You know, I really, you know, I've had a taste. If it's one of these near-death experiences with me. It wasn't death, but it was tasting what a phys physical experience might be, might be like if one had a, a physical disability and I said I kind of don't like it, I don't think I'm ready for it and if I get out in one piece, um, it wasn't a, a formal pledge or promise but I said look, um, I will just never ever take any day for granted, it's, um, you know, I've tasted what it might be like. And MS doesn't go away, you live with it. Yeah but look I have, I, I actually really choose not to talk about it publicly, not that I'm in any way embarrassed but I've just ended up beautifully being in a, in a very good place. I can honestly not say that I'm affected by it anymore. I just get some slight sensations every now and then and they're the best things that can happen to me because they're my little reminder of, of you know, two or three <laughs> seriously disturbing experiences, you know, ten years ago. Now look, I, I go for a, a biannual 
brain scan, I've still got these, uh, they show up as white lesions. Um, they're still there, but they're just not doing anything at the moment. But they might do something tomorrow, so, <laughs> you know, I can't take a day for granted. Now, Amanda Jane, who is your wife, and obviously very astute, says you take on too much. <laughs> um, look, that's right, but only to a point, in that um, one of the, the good things about being that dunce of the class, which I talked about earlier, is that, you know, I'm really no great authority on anything. And, uh, and what that also means is that, sure, you look at the CV and, you know, I've been involved in, in lots of organisations and causes and all sorts of things, but I'm never really, I'm never the leader. Um, there are always people that are particularly skilled and focused and, and, um, and, and really the CV is just that. It's a list of, of lots of things that I've been involved in. But in truth, I'm really like most people. I need my veg out time. Um, you know, I like watching footy on the television, whatever. Um, I'm really not manic, but I've just ended up in a position though where um, I have been spread across a diverse range of causes, uh, but always looking for the opportunity to bring in one of those real authorities in any one of those causes when the heavy lifting has to be done. So there's this huge diversity of things. You've mm. been involved in private corporation boards, NYOB yep. for instance, yep. uh, you mentioned Boral, uh, CSIRO now mm. is chair, MS Foundation, Vision Australia, mm. you're ambassador for this and that, yep. Earth Hour amongst other things. Yep. How, how strategic are you? Well, I th oh, as far as what I choose to do, oh, hopelessly, you know, no, I'm a, um, it's interesting in that that question's been asked a few times and uh, any investment banker knows that, you know, our role often is to provide, um, you know, input into the strategic position of a large corporation and making decisions that affect it for, for years to come. But with me, um, and I'm not embarrassed anymore to say that I, I have literally wandered through life and doors have opened. And, uh, and I've wandered into them if the cause has felt right for me and in particular the people have been good around that cause. Um, it's, it's that simple. And uh, um, uh, probably the only area that I'm not particularly involved in is the arts because, uh, I mean, I love the arts, I really do. Um, but I think there's lots of other people that can do that stuff. But everywhere else, which is generally social justice or needs related, I'm always interested. With a business background, such a strong business background, I mean there are obviously positives you can bring to a role in a not-for-profit. Do you see mm. a shadow side to it though as well, that actually you know, imposing a business model on a not-for-profit is actually the wrong way to go? No, not at all. Um, I'm continually looking for ways in which really talented business people or the organisations themselves can actually um, underpin the non-for-profit movement. Look, there are three great tribes, I guess, if you like, non-for-profit sector, government, business, and they sometimes speak a different language and operate differently. But the charitable sector nowadays, some of those, um, some of the entities are just massive and they need desperately all the best of efficiency, effectiveness, scale, um, whether it's IT departments, strategic thinking, marketing, that business can actually provide. And you know, one of the most pleasing things is when somehow I can join a couple of dots together, get a really skilled IT department who at a certain part of the year are not actually being um, pushed to their limit, they've got a bit of capacity, and they can assist a non-for-profit in such an important area as IT. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, actually getting the best of business to help uh, the non-for-profits. What I would say is that the non-for-profit sector sometimes has something that business doesn't have, and that's passion. And uh, it's a real zeal for doing something. And what's wonderful is that that's what the non-for-profit sector can give back to business. Um, you know, I've seen firsthand uh, extraordinary things flow back to business when they actually see what real passion's about. Talking about passion, you and your partner have been the world's fastest <laughs> sailors. We have, yeah, the last 20 years we've, um, uh, probably for most of it actually uh, held the world sailing speed record and that's been a, uh, a great uh, a great endeavour. 52 knots? Yeah, we were the first people to get a sailboat to, to go through this mythical 50 knot barrier which is just under 100 k's, 100 kilometres per hour. It's really um, fast for a sailboat. Yeah, well the average speedboat 
you know, is lucky to do about 35 knots, you know, with 90 horsepower on the back. Um, going on the water is a lot harder than going on, on land. And um, yeah, up over 50 knots, it's, it's, a, it's a fast ride, but yeah, uh, the French have just taken the record off us a year or so ago, so we've got to get it back. French? Yep. And my syndicate isn't very happy with uh, the fact that I've got this busy year this year. <coughs> we've had to put our challenge back a few months, but uh, we'll be out there next year. Simon, it's been great talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Mm.